from ABC News. A television event. 100 years in the making. The century. October 1944. Private Joe Wheeler and thousands of his fellow American soldiers are under devastating fire from German artillery as they fight their way across Italy. Half a world away, his brother John is in his own race to stop Hitler. John Wheeler is a physicist working on the Manhattan Project to develop an atomic bomb before Hitler does. They are driven by news from the front. From the battlefield, Joe sends a postcard to his older brother. The scientist understands his brother's message completely. The postcard says simply, hurry up. The century, ultimate power. The streets of Berlin, 1938. The dark forces of human nature have already gathered here. They appear unmistakably in the face of Hitler, now wielding absolute power in Germany. They echo in the footsteps of these men, who will before long make much of Europe their prisoner. They are clear in the growing terror visited on the Jews. There is another force about to be revealed here in Berlin. On a gray December day in a government laboratory, a German chemist split atoms of uranium. In a simple experiment, he discovered the key to unlocking the enormous energy stored inside the atom. In no time, news of the discovery reached other scientists all over the world. The general view was that uh, no one would ever live to see nuclear energy. That was just a, a, a totally impossible. And all around there was a buzz for a few days that week and all the experiments had something to show. Couldn't resist talking about it, speculating. War was in the air. The, the way was very clear from fission to a power reactor and a bomb. And, and I think people understood that right from the start. And it was clear that there could be an explosive of power far beyond anything that had previously been seen. One man had seen it coming. Leo Szilard had been worrying about the possibility of an atomic bomb for years, when it was still science fiction. Szilard was an eccentric, Hungarian-born physicist who had worked in Germany for a dozen years. He was one of the first Jewish scientists to understand that Hitler threatened the world, and he had left Germany in 1933 and was living in New York when he heard the news. Szilard, uh, alone among his colleagues, was deathly frightened of the news that the uranium atom would split because he had left Germany as a refugee where he knew the best physics had been going on. Szilard, in particular, realized immediately that the fact that nuclear fission had been discovered meant that Nazi Germany might well already be at work on an atomic bomb. And the idea of a Third Reich with atomic bombs to enforce its horrors, horrified him. Zillard, semi-penniless, recent emigre, characteristically thought, how can I reach the president of the United States with this extraordinary fact? And he thought, well, Einstein's famous. Let's go talk to him. Albert Einstein and Leo Zillard had been friends in Berlin in the years before Hitler. Szilard took another Hungarian scientist with him to the meeting, the young Edward Teller. He called me and asked me to do one thing he cannot do. He could not drive a car. And he wanted to talk to Einstein, so I was employed as his chauffeur. Einstein was at his summer home on New York's Long Island. The two men recreated the meeting years later as an historical record. Einstein was a pacifist, but he was also a Jewish refugee from Germany, and his fear of the Nazis was profound. Szilard was certain that with Einstein's name on a letter to President Roosevelt, 
the president would take their warning seriously. The Einstein letter was to be delivered to the president personally. But by the time it got to him, events in Europe had taken a dramatic turn. On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. In only a month, Poland crumbled and the widespread massacre of the Polish Jews began. The defeat of Poland, I expected, as did everybody. But the defeat of France was a terrible shock. Hans Bethe was another gifted scientist who'd been forced to leave Germany because of his Jewish heritage. He too had fled to the United States. He saw that perhaps European culture would be completely destroyed by the Nazis who were acting as savages, truly as savages, both mentally and physically. A month after the invasion of Poland, when Roosevelt finally received the Einstein letter, he was not convinced by its urgency. All he did was authorize the formation of a research committee so the scientists could meet with the military. But when Szilard and a few colleagues finally sat down with the Army and the Navy, they were not taken seriously. The Army representative was totally skeptical. Understandably, people were talking about five, ten pounds of a rather exotic piece of metal destroying a city. And remember, these were men who had just come from Europe. Most of them had heavy accents, Hungarian, Italian, German. They looked like classic crackpots. Szilard is going crazy at this time. He's been living with this fear for years. He, he hears rumors from immigrant scientists that the Germans are really working. He's becoming more frantic. He's trying to spur his colleagues on to work harder and harder. And uh, at the same time, he's powerless. The refugee scientists in America heard specific news that few people even noticed, and it convinced them of Hitler's intentions about an atomic bomb. The German War Department had taken over the country's finest laboratory, and the Nazi government had outlawed the export of uranium from Czechoslovakia, which the German army now occupied. Czechoslovakia was the principal source of uranium in Europe. There was no doubt that the German bomb project had begun. December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. When America went to war, it committed itself completely to the war effort. The war gave a new sense of urgency to the top secret atomic bomb program. Leo Zillard finally got what he wanted. Then my wife and I were just about to sign up for the Army Air Corps. And uh, this professor, his name was Joyce Stern, says, don't do that. Wait a couple of weeks. I think there's something that'll be more important and be better for you and better for the country. So we waited, and next thing I knew, uh, I was on my way to Chicago. At the University of Chicago, Agnew joined Leo Szilard and a small group of scientists led by the Italian Nobel Prize winner Enrico Fermi. They worked tirelessly to prove that the atomic bomb could be built. And they were convinced the Germans were still years ahead. We were always worried as to what the Germans were doing. You must keep in mind that the center for all this activity pre-war was in Germany. Fermi had studied in Germany, Beta was in Germany, Szilard was there. Uh, the Center for Nuclear Physics Study was in Germany. And so uh, we always worried about what the Germans were up to. It was a troubling time for Szilard. Even while pushing the scientists to produce a bomb before the Germans, he worried what impact this weapon might have on the future of the world. On the morning of December the 2nd, 1942, one year after Pearl Harbor, the scientists were on the brink of a breakthrough. In a squash court under the abandoned football stadium at the University of Chicago, Szilard and Fermi had designed and built the world's first nuclear reactor. The Germans had discovered that by firing a neutron into a uranium atom, the atom would split, releasing a burst of energy. 
But the splitting atom would also release something else, more neutrons, which would split other nearby atoms. Fermi and Szilard believe that with the uranium properly arranged in a reactor, they could create a chain reaction that would expand to split billions of atoms and released vast amounts of energy. If they succeeded, they would prove the basic principle for a bomb. But it was a dangerous experiment. The scientists had packed the uranium in blocks of graphite which would slow down the process and keep the reaction under control. But if this experimental reaction went too fast, it might explode like a bomb. On the cold, dimly lit squash court, the scientists watched as the experiment began. Fermi ran the reactor for 28 minutes. For a moment, these scientists had harnessed the most basic energy in the universe. The atomic bomb was now more than a theoretical possibility. Szilard went up and shook hands with Fermi and said, I think this is going to be a black day in the history of mankind. He saw that this would lead to a nuclear arms race. He saw that this would spread atomic energy, not for peaceful, but for military purposes. By the end of 1942, the Manhattan Project, as the program was now called, had already been placed in the hands of the military. The man in charge was a hard-driving, decisive army general named Leslie Groves. His orders were clear, finish a bomb as soon as possible. Within a week of taking over, Groves purchased 59,000 acres in rural Tennessee where he planned to build a plant to enrich uranium. Four months later, he decided to buy 500,000 acres in eastern Washington for massive reactors to make plutonium. Groves was a bold and often abrasive military man who did not think much of the scientists. He took an instant dislike to Leo Zillard. Zillard was mortally offended, understandably. He was partly offended because he realized that these, there were moral issues involved in this, which I think Groves wasn't interested in at all. This was a weapon, he built the weapon, then properly constituted officials decided what to do with the weapon. But Zillard understood that it was a weapon that would destroy cities, and that there were weapons beyond it, hydrogen weapons that would destroy countries, and that there were very deep issues about war and humanity and human rights that needed to be a part of all of this discussion. General Groves thought Zillard and his concerns were a danger to the project, but Groves did not understand atomic science, and he knew he needed a scientific director if he was going to have a working weapon. He turned to J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was teaching theoretical physics at the University of California. It was a very unlikely choice in the eyes of most of his colleagues. He had never been an administrator. He was a teacher. He seemed rather ethereal and poetic and, and, and literary from the point of view of physicists who tend to be some pretty practical kind of engineering-like guys. But General Groves went out to see him, and Groves was dazzled. Oppenheimer came from a wealthy New York family. He'd been educated at Harvard and had a passion for metaphysical poetry and Eastern philosophy. Military intelligence objected to Oppenheimer's ties to the Communist Party. The FBI had actually placed him on a list of Americans to be arrested in case of national emergency. But General Groves saw only a brilliant scientist who believed deeply in the importance of building a bomb which would end the war. Unlike Zillard, Robert Oppenheimer believed that the bomb would be a benefit to mankind because it would make future wars impossible. Over the objections of military intelligence, Groves got his man. Robert Oppenheimer set out to recruit the best scientific minds in the country for a project so secret that most were told nothing except that their country needed them and they should go to an address in Santa Fe. 
Boyce McDaniel and Ken Grison came from Cornell University. Uh, arriving at uh, Santa Fe, that uh, was quite an experience. You know, you're going into a circumstance you've never, don't know quite what you're getting into. You're going to be there a while, a long while. It was wild. I mean, we drove on a, a little highway up to a certain point and then turned off on something that started out being a little dirt road. And we were sure we were lost. And then we climbed uh, a steep winding road up to a mesa and we were still sure we were lost. But ultimately we came to a, a little uh, guard house uh, with a soldier at it. <laughs> we knew we were in the right area. They had arrived at Los Alamos. 26-year-old Martin Deutsch had fled Austria and was working at MIT. It had sort of a Shangri-La unreality to it. The whole atmosphere, of course, had something unreal about it. it uh, you got there and you saw uh, all the great names in the field. And, uh, it was a very exciting, very exciting thing. Los Alamos was a, a paradise for scientists. You met the people, about the scientists about whom you only read in, the, in books, in, you know. Joseph Rotblatt was a physicist who'd been in England when the Germans invaded his native Poland and Phil Morrison had been working on the Manhattan Project at the University of Chicago. It was a tiny community of old friends or old acquaintances and people with a great common interest. So it was an amazing experience. Conspicuously absent at Los Alamos was Leo Szilard. His conflicts with General Groves kept him in Chicago. But soon there were hundreds of scientists working in New Mexico. I did not know with any certainty that the project was a bomb project. Not that I was opposed to it. Of course one had to do it if it was possible, uh, because uh, I'm sure the, the enemy had no hesitation doing it. I had not the slightest hesitation about that. But I felt, like many of my colleagues, almost to the end, that what we really hoped we would find was that it couldn't be done. The main reason for pursuing the work was to make sure it couldn't be done. If it couldn't be done, then nobody could have it. Everyone seemed to understand that time was precious. Oppenheimer organized the scientists into divisions, experimental physics, theoretical physics, chemistry, metallurgy, and ordnance. Hans Bethe was given the key job of running the theoretical division. The Manhattan Project now had hundreds of the country's brightest minds. At Los Alamos alone, there were four Nobel Prize winners and 10 others who would go on to win the prize in later years. The hard work was driven by the news from overseas. American forces were struggling north through Italy and across the islands of the Pacific. Everyone knew someone who'd gone to war. There was a time when we thought we were losing the war because a lot of my friends, gosh, a whole gang of them had been killed in the Pacific as well as in uh, Italy and in Germany. And I think we, we were just uh, really motivated. You really wanted to, to win in the damn thing. We were not living high on a mountainside ignoring the rest of the world at all. We were very much concerned with the progress of the war. The war was not going well. I was convinced that the Germans were working on the bomb. Uh, I thought they probably were ahead of us, way ahead of us. By 1944, the Manhattan Project had been given the military's highest priority. More than 100,000 people were working at half a dozen sites around the country. 6,000 men and women were working at Los Alamos. When Los Alamos was set up, it was supposed to be a total of 30 scientists. And it was supposed to be much easier than it actually turned out to be. We worked six days a week, and people enjoyed it. I just thought everything was great. I would say it was, to me, those years, it would be 43 through 45 were the most exciting years in my life. The atmosphere, the, the intellectual level, 
It was just fantastic. Well, we worked pretty hard, but it was a, a young uh, community, a young, I was just a kid, I just some, barely finished graduate work. Yes, we worked together and we played together by and large. We weren't parties all the time, but there were pretty regularly people gather in someone's home. We didn't talk business particularly when we were off because it was we weren't supposed to go around chatting about our work. But we we were just had a good time. The general was very upset with uh reproduction rate at uh, Los Alamos. And they kept, they didn't like the building these big hospitals and having the doctors and all that, but there wasn't much he could do about that. Of course, everybody was young. The average age was 25. It was such a compelling common bond among us. No one there ever forgets it. Yes, there were hardships. Yes, there were difficulties. Yes, there was an impossible problem. Yes, there were even tragedies. And we knew the whole thing was tragic in its essence. But it seemed to be a necessity thrust upon us by this history. The Allied landing at Normandy, June the 6th, 1944. I remember very vividly the invasion of Normandy and thinking, that, boy, I sure hope the, the Germans uh, don't have the bomb because we had a million men in those square mile or two there. I know that there, there was always the talk, well, that they might, how fast are we going and how presumably they could do it just as fast as we could do it, if not faster. A German atomic bomb might have put a stop to the Allied invasion of Europe, but the Allied forces pushed on across France and into Germany. General Groves was determined to find out what the Germans were doing and to keep any bomb information or material away from America's Russian allies who were advancing from the east. The general created a special unit to scour the countryside for evidence of the German bomb program. In one place, they caught German scientists trying to escape. In another, the team confiscated German uranium, which they shipped home immediately so that it could be used at Los Alamos. The search team scientific director, Samuel Goodschmidt, was a Dutch physicist who'd been living in the United States. He did not find much evidence of a bomb, but he did discover the fate of his parents. They had died in one of the concentration camps, now being liberated by Allied troops. It was a grim reminder of the evil which the Allies were racing against. In April, with the Allies closing in on Berlin, President Roosevelt died from a massive cerebral hemorrhage and a virtually unknown politician became the 33rd president of the United States. When Harry Truman took the oath of office on April the 12th, 1945, he'd been vice president for only 82 days. He had met with President Roosevelt only twice, and he had never heard of the atomic bomb. Within weeks, Germany was on the verge of defeat. April the 30th, 1945, with the Allies closing in on his underground bunker, Adolf Hitler took his own life, his dream of a German Reich in ruins around him. The Allies discovered that Hitler had denied his atomic scientists the resources they needed to build the weapon. He'd never understood the potential of the atomic bomb. On the 8th of May, 1945, Germany officially surrendered. At Los Alamos, a few scientists began to reconsider what they were doing now that the threat of a German bomb no longer existed. The whole purpose of my being on the project, namely to prevent Hitler from having his bomb, seemed to be misplaced. So I immediately said, OK, in this case, I am resigning from the project because the whole purpose of my being there is no longer. If the Germans are not making the bomb, therefore there's no reason why we should make the bomb. It is true that it's, it's also hard to understand why the enthusiasm for continuing the work continued at Los Alamos even after the Germans clearly were out of the war. But, of course, that was true for the whole country. It wasn't just us. 
the war had become an indissoluble war. There were two fronts. We had to win them both. Virtually all of the scientists at Los Alamos stayed with the project. We knew the Japanese war was a very bitter war, and the uh, project had momentum of its own, so it automatically went on. So somewhere around there, it became not a weapon to end a war or a weapon to beat someone else to the weapon, but a new weapon. In Chicago, Leo Zillard was still concerned with the long-term consequences of the bomb. He had been dedicated to beating the Germans. But with Germany defeated, Zillard feared that American use of the bomb in Japan would only force the Soviet Union to build a bomb as well. Well, Szilard always was about five years ahead of everybody else, of course, and, and, and he saw that this would be a, 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 a catastrophe if it went on. That, I mean, he, he clearly saw the United States and the Soviet Union accumulating these bombs in huge quantities, and he wanted to, to get in there first and stop it. Leo Szilard had once warned President Roosevelt about the need to build a bomb. Now he felt the need to warn President Truman that it must stop. In May of 1945, Zillard managed to arrange a meeting with the president. But when he got to the White House, he was sent instead to Spartanburg, South Carolina, to see Truman's chief advisor, former Senator James Burns. Burns was about to become Truman's Secretary of State. He'd never heard of Leo Zillard. Zillard was trying to warn Burns about a post-war nuclear arms race with Russia. Well, Burns was just the wrong person to talk to. Burns considered himself knowledgeable in atomic energy. He thought that the bomb would make the Russians more manageable in Europe after the war. And so the one person who wanted to control the bomb and the one person who wanted to use it found themselves in the same living room talking at odds. A few weeks later, Burns and Truman left for the Potsdam Conference outside Berlin. President Truman would meet the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin for the first time and consult with the Allies about how to end the war against Japan. Truman knew that a test of the bomb was imminent. The scientists had carved out a test site in a barren stretch of New Mexico desert. Robert Oppenheimer named it Trinity. On July the 11th, Phil Morrison was driven the 200 miles from Los Alamos to the test site with the world's first plutonium core in the trunk. So one fine day, and it came the day, and I drove down in the car at 75 miles an hour all the way down to the desert, probably the most dangerous activity that I ever engaged in in the war. In the stifling desert heat, they began the painstaking final assembly of the world's first atomic device. Oppenheimer supervised the work personally. The sphere had an opening uh, plug, sort of like a plugged watermelon. Uh, it had an opening all the way down, and uh, you would work down through that hole to put the active material in the center. Packed neatly at the center of the thousands of pounds of high explosives was the small plutonium core. But in addition to the precision-made components, the first bomb was put together with cardboard, tissue paper, and household masking tape. Two days before the test, on July the 14th, the assembled bomb was hoisted slowly into the steel tower. Army mattresses were put underneath, just in case the winch broke. In all, 32 separate detonators would have to be wired to the explosives once it was in the tower. Each detonator was set to fire within millions of a second. Ultimately, I and two young men from my group were the ones to climb the tower and, and wire up the detonators, connect, put them in place on the bomb. And it was a little bit scary being up there with all that high explosive because an electrical storm came up too, I mean, rain and lightning and that sort of thing. So for many hours, we were just hanging around there, very, very tense and so on. It was a long, long night. The senior staff, 
placed bets on how powerful the bomb would be. Edward Teller put in his dollar and guessed it would be equivalent to 45,000 tons of TNT. Hans Bethe guessed 8,000 tons. Enrico Fermi was taking side bets on the possibility that the bomb would incinerate the state of New Mexico or even ignite the atmosphere and destroy the world. General Groves was not amused. On the day of the test, July the 16th, President Truman was taken on a tour of Berlin. He wrote in his diary, never have I seen a more sorrowful sight. I hope for some sort of peace, but I fear that the machines are ahead of morals by some centuries. In New Mexico, all the observers had been given dark welder's glass to shield their eyes. They lay flat in the dirt of shallow trenches to protect them from the blast. At 5.29 a.m., five miles from ground zero, cameras inside heavy bunkers were rolling. I was very, very shaken. If uh, someone says, we say, oh my God, that's what we've been doing. And then it was such a beautiful thing. That was the other thing. It was really beautiful. And uh, that was another thing that left me very puzzled. Hans Bethe. First, I thought we have done our job. And second, I thought, what a terrible thing have we created. This really can destroy the world. Robert Oppenheimer. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. The last year of the Pacific War was the killing year. The fighting dragged on for week after week at enormous cost in human life. The Japanese were unwilling to surrender despite their staggering losses. President Truman's military commanders had begun to discuss an invasion of the Japanese home islands, a chilling prospect for the tens of thousands of American soldiers being assembled in the Pacific. And it very much looked as if the closer we got to the Japanese home islands, the harder they would fight, even though they should have surrendered. So we were faced with the terrible dilemma that every punishing thing we could think of to do to convince them that the war was over and they had lost didn't seem to work. In the summer of 1945, on a small flat Pacific island called Tinian, more than a thousand miles from Japan, the 509th Airborne Group arrived with 15 special B-29 bombers each modified to deliver a single atomic bomb. With them came a small group of scientists from Los Alamos, now dressed in uniform. They had arrived on Tinian as the U.S. was conducting the deadliest bombing campaign of the war. American planes had dropped more than 300,000 tons of bombs on Japanese cities, burning them to the ground one of the most devastating raids of the entire Pacific War took place on the night of March the 9th, 1945.
American bombers burn 16 square miles of Tokyo. More than 100,000 men, women, and children were killed. Once you accept it, strategic terror bombing, it didn't make any moral difference whether you did it with one bomb or 500. So there was no doubt the moral step had already been taken when they firebombed Tokyo. That was the demonstration that they were committed to s s bombing of civilians. And if you did it with regular firebombs, then why not use nuclear bombs and do it more efficiently? By July, nearly the only cities left unbombed in Japan were the four which General Groves had taken off the Air Force target list. Kokura, Niigata, Nagasaki, and Hiroshima. General Groves wanted virgin targets so as to measure the true destructive power of the bomb. In Chicago, the man who'd done more than anyone else to launch the bomb project had not yet given up his struggle to stop it from being used against civilian targets. Leo Szilard organized a petition from his fellow scientists. To Truman, he was arguing that the bomb be considered with all its moral and political implications, not just as a military weapon, and uh, the bomb should be used in demonstration and not against actual cities. More than a hundred scientists working on the Manhattan Project signed the petition, and Zillard sent it off through official channels to President Truman. The president was still in Europe when he approved an order drafted by General Groves to use the bomb as soon as it became available. Zillard's petition never reached him. The first bomb was called Little Boy. Early evening, we were just called and said, uh, we're going to go tomorrow. And we went in for a briefing and just sat there, sort of wide-eyed, listening to the uh, operations officer saying what we were going to do. I remember one thing he said, no, if you have problems, we have submarines here, here, and here to pick you up. Harold Agnew, then 24, and two other scientists flew in an escort bomber on the Hiroshima mission. The bomb was on board the Enola Gay, flown by Colonel Paul Tibbets. On August the 6th, at 2.45 in the morning, three B-29s took off from Tinian and headed for Hiroshima. It was only three weeks since the first atomic bomb had been tested in New Mexico. In the port city of Hiroshima, population 300,000, it was a warm, clear morning. A few people noticed the three silver planes that appeared overhead at 8.15 in the morning, but no one took cover. took these pictures from the window of his B-29, 25,000 feet above Hiroshima. I was at Los Alamos when the news came of Hiroshima. I think we all uh, were happy because we thought this would end the war. Then a few days later, we uh, got the photograph, it was so much worse 
than I had expected. We had calculated how far buildings would be destroyed, but it was so much worse to actually see it. Of course, uh, there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm, a lot of feeling that, uh, you know, we've uh, succeeded, we're making a real impact, the uh, efforts are not for naught. But there are a lot of misgivings, of course, at that time when you find out what you what you've really done. I had no particular reaction. It did it did it did what it had been what it was supposed to do, and and I hoped the Japanese would give up immediately. One was enough. I was not happy with uh, with uh, Nagasaki. I thought that was unnecessary. The second bomb was called Fat Man. In Hiroshima, 75,000 people had been killed instantly. In the next five years, 125,000 others would die as a result of the bomb. The bomb on Nagasaki killed another 100,000. Five days later, the Japanese surrendered. When the race to build the atomic bomb began, the fear was that it would be used in the name of evil. After the world saw what the first bombs had done at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the fear became that such a weapon existed at all. On September the 23rd, 1949, the Soviet Union detonated its first atomic device. The Soviets got the complete plans of a bomb from their spies at Los Alamos. Their first bomb was based on our plans. Los Alamos not only designed the first American atomic bomb, it also designed the first Soviet atomic bomb. The U.S. responded by developing the hydrogen bomb, 800 times more powerful than the one dropped on Hiroshima. Within a year, the Soviets had a hydrogen bomb. Everything had changed. It was no longer possible seriously to consider world-scale war. In 40 years, there were more than 60,000 nuclear weapons on the face of the Earth. After the Soviets, the French, the Chinese, the Israelis, the Pakistanis, the Indians, the South Africans have all built nuclear weapons. But the bomb has not been used again. So far, man has had to recognize that there are limits to his impulses. If there is a, an all-out nuclear war, it's the end of civilization. I'm Peter Jennings for The Century. Good night. You can read more about this remarkable time in the century written by Peter Jennings and Todd Brewster, published by Doubleday and sold in bookstores everywhere. Also look for The Century Audiobook Edition, available on compact disc and audio cassette.